First of all, I wanted to uh, talk to you all a little bit about why we set up an industry day today. This morning, it's with you all face to face. And then this afternoon, we've got a VTC with upwards of around 15 sites around the country. And we sent out a notification to all of our uh, service related industry um, representatives to just try to give you the background as far as what we're trying to do to deal with the situation. And more importantly, ask for your help. <clears throat> when you look at uh, the way we get work done in naval aviation, when we deal with tough problems, at least for me, there's a pretty simple recipe to how to solve tough problems. You surround yourself with hardworking people who are creative and willing to take on tough challenges. You give them a very clear goal that everybody understands and agrees to, and you have a commitment to work together as a group. And so when you think about that recipe and you think about some of the tough things we got in front of us, we wanted to give you the opportunity to understand the problem, understand the goal we're trying to achieve, and then help us. Um, because as we go through some of the information today, I think it'll give you the context around the situations we're trying to deal with. And we think if we do that for you all, you'll have a better appreciation of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. So with that, I'm gonna go through a series of slides. <clears throat> we do have a handful of frequently asked questions in the back. What we've done is we've asked for input from, from various folks and various sources, and we've taken very specific questions and tried to make them into general questions. Um, so when you see these, if, you, if some of this is on your mind and it's not exactly worded the way you think, please try to just take on board the general comments and the general answers we're giving you because a lot of cases, I can't give you a specific answer to a specific question, but we think we can give you the general intent behind what's going on. Before I get started, <clears throat> I want to share with you all just a little bit of information around what NAVAIR is and what the commands are within NAVAIR, because we're going to talk a lot about finance. And when you all see us work with you, you don't get to see how the finances work how the business of NAVAIR, how the business of NOC AD, WD, and the FRCs really work. So I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining that because it'll give you a little bit of context behind the financial situation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at NAVAIR as a command, uh, we get direct appropriated dollars that are sent to us. And when those monies are sent to us, they're sent to us directly from the Navy for very specific things that we're, we're responsible for. So if you look at the overall numbers, we get RDT&E, we get procurement dollars, and we get OMEN dollars sent directly to us. To just give you an idea of what we expected in 13, we were expecting almost $6 billion in research and development money. We were expecting about $19 billion in procurement monies, and that would be both aircraft, weapons, as well as other procurements. We were expecting three almost three and a half billion dollars in OMEN. And so when you add all that up, you're looking at about $27 billion worth of finances. In addition to that, our working capital funds, both NOC AD, NOC WD, uh, aircraft division on the East Coast, weapons divisions on the West Coast, and our fleet readiness centers, three major industrial facilities, one in North Florida and Jacksonville, one in San Diego, and one in Eastern North Carolina. Those organizations are in charge of very specific functions where in many cases they're the expert for that function and the products centered around aviation. So they do work for other folks. That brings in about an additional $8 billion worth of money. So when you add all that up, between the direct appropriated dollars that we get, 27 billion-ish, and another 8 billion uh, of dollars from other services to execute, within these commands, that's the amount of money that we get. It's a lot. When you look at it in total, over 85% of that goes back out to industry. So in many cases, we take the monies in, formulate requirements, develop technical plans, and then we ask industry counterparts to go develop the hardware, software, technical solutions to deliver to the fleet. So that's a rather large amount of money but we also have a rather large amount of functions. We've got 10 operating sites, made, I'll say major operating sites around the country, and we have one over in Japan. So it's actually a worldwide operation. 
And of the organization that we talked about, there's 1,700 military folks attached to the command. There's almost 25,000 civilians attached to the command. And then our contractor workforce is about 6,000, just over 6,000 from a services level. And then we've got about another 3,000 that we use in our contractor logistic support, where when we make a decision not to support an aircraft organically with military, in many cases, we'll use contractors to support that. And so that's a large amount of people. Those amount, and those folks, when you add them all up, it's almost $5 billion of cost just around the people that we have on our teams. And so when we talk about financials, and I give you some of the large Navy issues, that's how we nav air fit in some of these rather large numbers. And it also gives you an appreciation of how much stuff we buy and how many people we need to produce the stuff that we buy. Um, and as we talk about some of the uncertainty, uh, I just want to remind you all, we have about 34 bargaining units within our civilian workforce. So when we're dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with, that's 34 bargaining units that represent about 11,000 civilians. And so we've got some things that we have to do on our side handling the civilian workforce as well as working with you all. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context around the organization before we got started. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and go through a handful of slides. <clears throat> First, I'm going to try to give you some awareness around what's going on, give you some key dates and activities, give you a handful of thoughts to consider from a contingency planning standpoint, and then we're going to have three sets of uh, frequently asked questions at the end. And then as we go through that, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end to potentially field a question or two, but as Adele said, I do have a hard stop at 1030. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so three terms that you're going to hear a lot if you're listening to the media and what's going on up with the testimonies yesterday and the day before. The first is continuing resolution. What does that mean? That means you can only spend the money that you had in the same amount from last year. And so you would think, well, that's okay. You're getting about the same money as last year. Well, as long as the work that you're doing this year is the same as last year, it works out great. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that's not the case in the Navy. The second thing you'll hear, no, no transfer authority. So we're not allowed to move around monies. It's very restrictive as far as how much money you can move around between very specific funding lines in the government. And as of right now, uh, we do not have any additional authority other than what we typically have to move monies around. And so we planned on spending more in OMEN this year compared to last year. So transfer authority for us would mean we would like to put more money into our OMEN accounts to support operations. And then the last part is sequestration. In very simple terms, it's an immediate 9% reduction in every funding line that the government has. And that is bi-directed in law and similar to the no transfer authority, it applies to every financial line equally. So when you hear those words, that's what it really means to us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how each one of those are impacting both the Navy operations and then talk to you a little bit about how it's affecting NAVAIR and our other commands operations. Next slide. I apologize. The engineer in me could not help but put a graph up some pictures, little flow charts. So I immediately apologize for it, but I just couldn't help myself. So the graph on the top, <clears throat> this shows you how much money the Navy was expecting to get to support operations this year and how much we will expect to get if the CR goes for the whole year, if sequestration would be invoked the 1st of March, and no transfer authority was given. So the Navy needed $49 billion to do all of the OMEN across all the commands within the Navy to do everything that we were asked to do. We expect to only get 40 if those three things don't change. So when you think about it, that's a decent drop. The worst part is we spent the first three months spending on the line heading towards 49 because we were hoping 
that this would be resolved in December. And so when you go through your first three months spending more than uh, on the top line, it puts a lot of pressure on the money that you have left. So what it really equates to, and you'll see the two lines start to separate in January, because we started curtailing our spending in January, because we realized that there was no, nothing in the foreseeable future that was going to change, and by law, we we're only going to be able to spend $40 billion unless something changes. So as we started to deal with that, we looked at reducing the remaining cost for the remainder of the year by 25%. That's how you would get to the number of 40 at the end of the year. So that sounds a little bit harder, but it's actually even a little worse because if you take out what's fixed cost within the Navy and you take out what are safety things that we will never stop doing, it's actually a 40% reduction of the things that we can actually trade off between now and the end of the year. So it's really hard. And so, if any of you all read the testimony over the last two days, think about 40% reduction in what we can afford to affect is why you're seeing the significant impacts to the Navy force on the operation side of the house. So how do you get from where you're at in January to, to the 40 billion in September? <clears throat> this is a picture of a chart that the CNO has been using to articulate what would we do to get there. Now, you can't read it on this chart, but each one of these little slices has activity associated with it that would be things we would stop or slow down to allow us to get back to the $40 billion line. And what you'll see is they're color-coded. Some greens, some reds, some yellows. Greens mean important but won't really hurt as bad as some of the other things. Yellow means it's hurting more red really bad. And what they are trying to do is lay it out over time. So these are January, February, March, April, May. And they are telling us to take actions on those as time goes on. So when you see the greens that are in January, those are the things we're doing today. And as you move out on time and you start to see yellows and the reds on the top slice above it, that's when things really start to hurt. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of that. This red slice is the slice that would get us to sequestration targets. So if you think of the smaller slice, that gets us to solve CRA. The slice in the other activities gets us to sequestration. When you add it all together, it's how we're going to get $9 billion out of this big organization between now and September. So like I told you, we're already taking some of these things on, and we're in February. So a lot of you ask, how are you going to set priorities? And so in the OMEN side, instead of being very specific about very specific work we're doing, I want to talk about general priorities. This account is funds operations, it funds maintenance, and it fun funds support. And so from a priority standpoint, the top priority of the Navy is going to be operations. And what, when you look at operations as a subset of that, forward deployed units are going to be the top priority. So I drew little nickels, dimes, and quarters on the bottom. And part of that was just an image thing to give you a picture, and part of it's real. So if you w see that line that goes from the quarter up to forward deployed operations, the, the impacts are happening already. Last week, the Navy was expected, prepared, to send a battle group to sea, the USS Truman, and all of the small ships that go with it. That entire carrier battle group is still here in the United States, not at sea. Because if they sent it out last week and sent it on a forward deployed operation per its schedule, it would chew up so much money for us and our operations budgets between now and September that the ship that's over there, when it came home, we would have parts of the world where there would be no carrier presence. So the Navy made that decision. And so the thousands of sailors who were ready to go are still here. Now their deployment shifts. 
So now when you think about the personal impact to a sailor, now all of their schedules as far as I was leaving, wife, family, coming back, hoping to see my kids at the end of the next school year, probably going on my next tour of duty to another location, all of that has now changed. And that's an indefinite decision. We're not sure when they're gonna go. So that happened last week. The next one I wanna talk about is the Little Dime, going up to the Get Ready units. We have a USS Lincoln aircraft carrier on the East Coast. This week it was supposed to go into dry dock, and what we mean by dry dock is we take the ships out of the water so that they're not in a corrosive environment, and then this particular ship was gonna go in for a nuclear refueling and overhaul event. That's a long period of time, a very complex operation, and it's pretty expensive. We don't have the money to do that, so it's now sitting at a pier, still in the water, getting light duty maintenance done by maintenance personnel attached to that ship until the Navy can afford to put it into the dry dock. When you start talking about carrier operations and military operations that the Navy and Marine Corps do, I like to call it a dance. It's a dance with a rhythm that allows us to continuously put group, battle groups and naval forces to sea. When you change the music quickly, like we're doing now, the whole thing gets messy. It's like watching a bunch of teenagers at a dance. It's gonna get messy. So that's what we're into now. So now that ship's not on its schedule to get refueled, which means it's not gonna come out when it's supposed to come out, which means the one that was supposed to go in behind it is now got, not gonna be able to go in. So that's happening right now. And then the last one, the nickel, the arrow that goes up to the depot. Right now, this morning, we are talking about how and when do we stop doing maintenance at our three major industrial depots for all the aircraft and all the engines for third and fourth quarter. Because if we spend that money, we won't be on the track for $40 billion. And so we've got a lot of workforce at those three industrial plants that don't know if we're gonna start taking in new airplanes next week. So I share that with you because these slices and these PowerPoint charts and these little words have a lot of really important things behind them right now. And they're actually happening. And so I want you to keep that in mind because when we talk about the precious omen dollars that we get at NAVAIR, 3.3 billion, right now, 2.6, right, Jerry? We think, the, we think our part of the 40 billion is 2.6. So that's a lot, and we're not allowed to spend any more than that, or lots of people get in trouble. Next slide. So let's talk about investment accounts. And when I say investment for you all, I'm talking about rdt and &E and procurements. Uh, there's a handful of types of money accounts for, for those of you who deal with us closely on the budget side, there's probably about six or seven different types of appropriations, but I'm generally gonna talk about everything that's not Omen, and I'm generally gonna talk about RDT and &E and procurements in a general sense. So what are the impacts to that part of our business? There's really three big things, very similar, same effects that we're talking about in Omen, but a little different. The first is no, tr no uh, authority to start new programs because of the Continuing Resolution Act. So we within NAVAIR had programs that we were gonna start this year that we're not allowed to start. Um, I'll give you the, the, one of our more important ones. The new aircraft carrier that we're supposed to start to build is not being built right now. So up in Lakehurst, the folks up there have this great technology of a new air launch and recovery system that allows us to put aircraft on and off ships in a, in a much different way. It's advancing us forward from a technology standpoint that was gonna be the next ship to get that equipment. And it's not being built right now. It will not be built until we resolve the, the new start issue. The second part is because we're so short in Omen, the transfer authority at the Navy level, and I think across the services, if you listen to the testimony over the last two days, they would move some amounts of money out of investment into Omen to do some of the things that we talked about on the last slide. 
So if there is some transfer authority, you would expect to see the Navy move some monies out of our DT&E and procurements over to Omen to start to put those ships and air wings back uh, into the operational cycle. And then the last one is the potential sequestration impact. On the investment side, that's significant because when we say a 9% reduction, it's every year. It's not just in one year. So the CRA issue is a very much fiscal year 13, we don't have a budget authority. Sequestration affects the whole plan. So that's why it's so important. So from a very general sense, and I'm speaking in, in very general terms, but the responsibility for prioritizing this stuff falls into our PEOs and PMAs. And so I'm gonna give you a couple of big things that I am sure they're thinking about when they're trying to prioritize their dollars. But inside each individual office, their situation's gonna be a little different. RDT&E activities, they're gonna look at the critical, critical activities that support their major program schedules. And so depending on where they're at in the life cycle of their system, it might be an IOC date, it might be a major acquisition milestone, it might be a major design review. Those are the types of things that they're gonna look at their schedules, they're gonna look at the monies that they have left, and they're gonna say, how can I preserve that event to the best that I can, knowing that I don't quite have as much money as I did before. And so you're gonna see them react in that way and focus that priority. On the far side, from a procurement standpoint, there's really two things that we do in procurement. The first thing that we do is we, when we buy the equipment, we stand it up in a fleet. So in many cases, we've got folks on the teams who take the equipment that we buy and they work on how do I implement it into the fleet, how do I stand up new squadrons, how do I stand up new units, how do I put all the logistics in place. They're gonna be focused on holding those deployment schedule or those fielding schedules to make sure that the equipment that we bought is actually gonna get out in the fleet and used in, a, in a, an appropriate schedule. The other thing they're gonna focus on, and this is where most of uh, the bigger chunks of the procurement dollars go, is in production schedules. They're gonna try not to go to such minimum levels of production that they disrupt the lines with industry. And so you're gonna see those two very significant things be a lot of the focus of the programs. So when you ask for what's mission essential within an investment account or an enomen account, if you can just think about these major things that these individuals that are being asked to prioritize in very specific um, taskings, they're driving towards these big things. Next slide. So, so now I talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Omen, a little bit about what's going on in 